Operation Ladbrook was the first major glider operation of the Second World War and the first ever glider attack by night. The operation took place on the 9th and 10th of July 1943 as the opening of Operation Husky. Ladbrook's objective was to land in Sicily an invasion force of glider infantry of the British 1st Airborne Division. The story of Operation Ladbrook is told here from the perspective of an American navigator, Paul Gale. Paul undertook 64 combat missions during the Second World War, but it was his very first mission, Operation Ladbrook, that disturbed him the most. July 9th, 1943 was my first combat mission, and we were under the umbrella of the, uh, of the British. The uh, Air Corps wasn't that organized, it wasn't that well formed we got over there. So we were under various designations of, if we're Allied Command, Mixed Allied Command, and we trained with the British, Red Devils. Well, I personally I only had two training missions with the gliders. We went on the invasion of Sicily. Now, of course, that was the most egregious mission in military history. I had 64 combat missions before I finished. That one disturbed me the most, although I had a subsequent mission on the 13th of July dropping the paratroopers, where I came back with 202 holes in the plane. But that was the way war was. It was the July 9th, 1943, and it was a night mission for which we had not trained. The winds were gale force winds up to 45 knots. I know you don't want retrospective thinking, but it, we, when we took off, there were 193 planes towing 193 gliders. We had not been given any change of the release coordinates. Now, you may not be aware, but when you went to the briefings, they told you where you were going, what routes they expected you to fly, and where they expect you to release these gliders, latitude, longitude, and altitude. We received no information for the change of uh, these coordinates, which had to be changed because the coordinates that we had were all for five or ten knot wind or calm weather. The gliders are on a 350-foot line towed behind us. They have a built-in gliding instance of about 15 to 1. Now, I'm telling you this because I'm aware of all of this at the time that we're taking off for the mission. If the winds change, then the coordinates have to change. When we took off, we're in this stream of planes. I had precious little navigation to do, just get in there and follow them until we got to Malta where there was a um, turning point, and then we would break off into groups depending upon which landing zone we were going to. So I sat down I was troubled by what was going on, and I sat down and computed a new coordinate. Now, you, you must know that we, we had no instrumentation other than a uh, magnetic compass. I had a drift meter. Now, a drift meter is something that you read on some landmarks, and you can tell how the plane is drifting, and you, and you can correct its attitude so that you're making a true course, even though the... the plane is sensibly flying in one direction, it's actually making a track over the ground in another. You need to be able to see something. When you're flying over the ocean, all you can see are waves and white caps. And I can read the drift over the white caps because we had what was called an astigmatizer on the drift meter that would take a white cap and make it a little line so that you could parallel that like it was a railroad track or a highway. But you can't do that at night. And we had no training at night. Without being able to, to read the winds, I just had to go by a feeling. Anyway, I changed the coordinate. I made them, I brought them in a little closer, and I made them a little higher. And I gave that to the pilot. And there was some discussion. What do you want me to do? I said, you got to move up. Well, I can't move up. There are planes over me. There are planes under me. There are planes alongside of me. I said, if you move up, they'll move up, because everybody's flying on everybody else. Otherwise, otherwise cut them loose here. They might as well drown here if you're going to drown someplace else. You want to go back and get a vote? Stuff like that. So we went up. Now, the instructions were to release the dog glider, I think, at 3,000 yards from shore. How the devil do you know when you're 3,000 yards from shore at night 
without any instrumentation, with without any pathfinders going through and lighting up the area where the glide is what it was supposed to be, there's no fixed point of reference. You can see the shoreline, maybe, but we had never had any practice, no. Anyway, I, I gave the new coordinates, we made the change, we released the gliders. When we got back, the anecdotal information we got was that uh, only 12 or 13 gliders made it to the landing zone. And I kept telling myself for 50 some odd years, they had to be mine. At least one of those had to be mine. From the perspective of the squadron, nothing went wrong. We sent out 12 planes. We got 12 planes back. We didn't lose a plane. Nobody was injured. Nobody was killed. It was a completely successful mission, and that's what the debriefing notes say. We knew it was a disaster because there was a, uh, a mutiny of sorts. They wanted to do another mission, and the uh, American uh, glider pilots refused to go. And threatened with court martial and whatnot. The response, the response was, you're only going to shoot one of us. You're not going to take down 15 others. So the word was there that it was just a total disaster. You know, these were the glider pilots. Now, the glider pilot's perspective was entirely different. He was in a much more precarious position. I mean, he had very little control. The only control he had was after we released him. And all he could do then was go down. They can't take any invasive action. He can't do anything to help himself. And then that, of course, what was troubling me all these years. There was a mission that we were scheduled for, for the 11th, 11th of July, which for our squadron uh, was aborted. And I do remember that, and that had, had quite a, uh, made quite an impression on me because the troops, these are all British boys now, are in the planes when the, the word comes that we're not going to take off. And I do remember these chaps breaking down. Some of them just broke down into tears. And that made a very lasting impression. And it occurred to me, we were getting chocolate chip cookies from home. You know, we'd get lovely letters. And these guys were getting letters telling them that their brothers, sisters, and families were injured or killed or their homes destroyed. It was a different war for them. Please help to rescue and preserve more memories of the Second World War. Visit www.war-experience.org.